Um, okay. So welcome everyone to today's session of the New Voices in Global Security series. Uh, my name is Dr. Mark Kondos. I'm a senior lecturer in Imperial and Global History uh, at the Department of War Studies, and I'm filling in today for Dr. Amanda Chisholm, uh, who uh, wasn't able to be with us. Uh, the paper we have lined up for today is entitled Tactical NATO Military Logistics in Major Warfighting, which will be delivered by Dr. Ronald T. Uh, Dr. T is a PhD candidate uh, at the Department of, or sorry, at Defense Studies Department uh, at King's College London. He has an undergraduate degree, uh, uh, sorry, undergraduate medical degree, um, and further postgraduate degrees in management, business administration, and tropical medicine. Uh, and most recently, as I understand it, uh, an MA in military history and strategic studies from the National University of Ireland, uh, Maynooth. Um, Dr. T is also a recent graduate of the Higher Command Studies course at the Baltic uh, Defense College in uh, Estonia. Um, so welcome, uh, Dr. T. Uh, we're also joined uh, this afternoon by uh, our discussant, uh, Dr. Patrick uh, Bury, uh, who's a senior lecturer in security at the Polis Department at the University of Bath. Uh, Dr. Bury specializes in warfare and counterterrorism. And as I understand it, also logistics, which is, of course, going to be very relevant um, to the topic at hand today. Uh, he's a former British Army captain and a NATO analyst. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. T. So please uh, go ahead. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, uh, Patrick, for being my discussant. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this meeting. I will now share my screen. Um, here we go. Just reflecting three years ago, we wouldn't have been doing this online, but times change. Okay. So, so uh, Mark, can you see that first slide? And can you hear me? Yep, everything looks okay. great. All right, thank you very much. So uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mark, Patty, to this uh, talk on tactical NATO military logistics and major warfare. Um, the usual disclaimer at the beginning, and I stress this is all my personal opinion, not the uh, official views of the Australian Department of Defence. Representations of commercial firms do not uh, imply endorsement and the pictures are, are not all under uh, open access. They're not copyright. Um, I'm not going to read through the slides. The key one here is I am actually originally a medical doctor by trade. So I'm not a real doctor. That's the study that I'm doing at the moment. Um, so perhaps I'll end up being a doctor doctor. But uh, in and mixed in with all that, is uh, a, a background in the military and a work history as long as my arm with deployments and postings. Enough said, you can read that. So I'm um, starting from the point of view of what's all this logistics stuff. There is a war going on in, in uh, the Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine. If you're one of the folk who thinks it's a special military operation, this is not your seminar, disconnect now, okay? It is a war. And logistics has come up. We've all seen the pictures of the Russian logistics column banked up north of Kiev, and we've seen abandoned Russian military equipment. So that's a T-80 sticker price of about 3 million US, not including GST, 2.6 million pounds, captured intact with intact fire control systems and everything. This logistics stuff is responsible for that tank falling into Ukrainian hands completely un unblemished, completely operatable. It's logistics that stop that tank. So this talk is aimed to you if you don't sleep with a logistics textbook under your pillow, it's to explain what's the logistics about and why does it matter and how does it affect us. So this talk is about the following points. Um, I will talk a little bit about resilience at the end. I will talk about future war, but it's not really future war. And I will relate all this to the Russia-Ukrainian war and how it's changing how we do military medical logistics in particular, because that's my area. I have worked as a general log logistician in the military, but military medical logistics is actually my PhD topic and it's my specialist field. It's that sliver of 2% that is actually quite critical to fighting and winning wars. So, quick audience question, do not answer this, it's not interactive. What is this a picture of? Five seconds to think about it. This picture is totally this lecture in one picture. Everyone's seen it, keep it in your mind. So first to logistics, logistics is old. This is a quote from Alexander the Great, okay? It really matters. I think quoted from Arian, one of the um, contemporary writers. It's been around a long time. Logistics as you may know it, this stuff, 
I mean, the commercial world logistics is often used in a really imprecise way. Uh, it's written on the side of trucks. It's on ads for logistics companies, but it's basically in the civilian and commercial world about warehousing, stock keeping and distribution of goods. It's actually quite straightforward. This is the NATO definition of logistics. And the thing to point out here is it is a very wide definition from doctrine. And I'll put a red ring around medical and health service support because in the NATO military, medical and health support on the battle space is logistics, okay? So when I talk about military medical or military medical logistics, it is logistics. And this is logistics as the military know it. So right-hand picture is a good old Australian army setting up a deployable healthcare facility in the middle of nowhere, a fly-bitten, snake-ridden Australian army training area. And there we have the movement of material in the bottom left-hand corner. And the top left-hand corner is a reverse osmosis water purification system set up in Bunda Aceh during the tsunami. So this is logistics as the military know it. And the military know logistics as being different because we are often, no wrong, always working in a degraded, damaged or non-existent infrastructure environment. There is a factor called the enemy, who is not just a commercial competitor. And in this situation, the mission is paramount. So what are those two pictures? On the left is Lolaho in Bougainville, where I served as a peacekeeper. This is not my picture. This is an entire port infrastructure that was destroyed by the tropical heat and rust. We couldn't use any of it, but we were based there. On the right-hand side is a healthcare facility that we rebuilt after a 10-year civil war, and that was where we were conducting civil aid tasks at medical clinics. This is where we work. This is military logistics. A little bit of a word on fuel supply. So on the left is my beloved VW Passat estate. 60-litre fuel tank goes about 500k or 50 miles in an M25 traffic jam. On the right is an M1A1 main Abrams main battle tank. 1,900-litre fuel tank. It needs to be filled up every eight hours. It's 4,000 litres a day. If you do a lot of manoeuvring, that literage figure can increase by 50%. So that's what we're talking about, the, the logistics of supporting offences and uh, military operation. I'll spend a little bit of time on this funny squiggle diagram. For those of you in the know, this is clear as, clear as ABC. What this is is a tactical map. The symbols in blue are tactical symbols that represent military units. And this is the fantasy that we are still teaching students at military colleges about solid front lines, borders between and almost in Napoleonic lines, which are impenetrable. This is no longer the case. The arrow looking at BSA, not a UK motorcycle company of the 60s, but a brigade support area. And this is where logistics and military medical logistics sits behind a front line supported by layers of troops that somehow magically stop the enemy from penetrating towards your soft logistic area. This is no longer the case, still being taught in current NATO staff colleges. So let's talk about Ukraine and the four points that are in the uh, the spiel on the, on the internet about my talk are, we're gonna talk about technical and logical advances, Russian targeting behavior, the use of hybrid actors and the nature of Russian offensive doctrine itself. None of this is new. Nothing in this talk is new. It's all been signposted and indicated in the last 20 years regarding Russia. Okay, so it's more of the same. Let's do the technological advantages. There are a lot of these. The unmanned aerial systems or uninhabited aerial systems, which is the new politically correct term. Um, you've heard of the Bayraktar TB2, TB2 drone. I believe Bayraktar is the Turkish word for victory or triumph. Um, the Harup is an Israeli drone that's been around for 13 years. These bad boys are at the altitudes that you can see there. The Bayraktar in particular can last for 27 hours in the sky. You can't hear it or see it from the ground, uh, but it can hear and see you. And you, everyone in the audience will have seen the um, footage that Ukrainian media are putting out on YouTube of Russian uh, soldiers being zapped by uninhabited, unmanned aerial systems. They are out there and they're making a big effect on the battle space. Um, what's not being featured are these medium altitude, long endurance systems. So these two drones, uh, $200,000 for the DX3 uh, UAS, has a three meter wingspan and a 1500 kilometer range, 1500 kilometers. Well, in Australia, that's the difference between Melbourne and Sydney and back again, okay? Um, the QXX222 can go at 
uh, almost 85% mark, which is about 400 miles an hour, 450 miles an hour. It can carry two 250 kilogram bombs up to two and a half thousand kilometers, right? These are medium altitude, long endurance systems that can reach out and strike in your rear area that no longer exists. I put it to you that if you load up enhanced explosive into those 250 kilogram bombs, it is not the effect of a 250 kilogram bomb. So putting a tenfold increase in enhanced explosives, it could be the equivalent of two, two and a half thousand kilogram conventional explosives. So the point of all this is uh, also that um, the battle space is constantly being monitored and we see this in Ukraine as well. Planet.com, you can subscribe to planet.com. They have 180 satellites in orbit and they will give you two meter resolution images of the, of the globe um, refreshed every 24 hours soon every six hours. So in the words of Joe Frazier, the uh, boxer, he can run, but he can't hide. So there is no rear area, okay? So um, the picture on the left-hand side is an Azerbaijani drone feed. These were Armenian troops, I think 25, 30 kilometers behind the line. They got out of their truck, stretched their legs, had a cigarette. And this is the picture of them a second before they were all destroyed by a, Azerbaijani drone. So there is no more rear area. And this is certainly what we're seeing in Ukraine with civilians 1,500 kilometres behind the line being targeted by Russian um, missile systems. Big challenge is for logisticians to think tactically. More on this in a moment. So everyone's familiar with the concept of no man's land in World War I. So this is an area that was swept by fire that you could not enter, dead ground. Raise your head, you'll get it shot off. It's the entire Baltic region now in no man's land. So if you have missiles that have a range of 1,500 kilometres, if you have bad boys like that Russian uh, intermediate range ballistic missile, the whole of your country is a no man's land, functionally, effectively. And this is certainly what's being uh, reflected in, in Ukraine. Now we go on to Russian targeting behaviour, willful disregard of international humanitarian law. Now, Russia has demonstrated a consistent pattern of behaviour. A couple of points there to do with placing targets of military value next to churches and places of cultural value. Targeting medical facilities directly. I have that on first hand from Georgian colleagues in the Georgian Military Medical Service. Uh, and the excuse is always that collateral damage, the euphemism for um, uh, non uh, targets of non-military value being hit, is that its targeting is imprecise. From what we can see, and we don't have enough data to support things at the moment, uh, conclusions at the moment, we haven't been here long enough to make conclusions, it looks like the Russian Federation are up to the same tricks in Ukraine. This is a demonstrated and consistent pattern of behaviour. Now, if you say that, well, it's due to targeting being a very imprecise science, this argument is consistently not holding much water as time goes by. Um, with medical facilities in particular, getting back to the question of military medical logistics, um, in the new barbarism of war, do laws of armed conflict have moral power to hold parties responsible anymore? Now, this is a hospital in Syria hit by accidentally, possibly, by a, a Russian or Syrian piloted um, vehicle launching a, a missile. That's a whole argument about laws of armed conflict and the erosion of the nation state. I won't go into it here, but this is one of the symptoms of that. Russia has signed and ratified the Geneva Conventions. That's the good news. You get a smiley for that, but you also get a non-smiley for how many times uh, medical facilities were targeted in Syria by Syrian and Russian planes in the eight month period. According to two sources, between 200 and 300 times. By my math, that's at least one to two times a day. Right, the next point is the use of hybrid actors such as private military companies and other proxies. Um, here's a bit of a rogue gallery. You see the little green men in the middle, the left, uh, Islamic State on the on the middle to the right. Dennis Pushilin and the other bloke on the left, um, let me move this icon, Pasheshnik, I'm sorry to the Russian speakers in the audience. They are respectively the leaders of Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic, not recognised by anyone. Yevgeny Prigozhin, pardon my pronunciation, Vladimir Putin's ex-celebrity chef, is actually the worst kept Kremlin secret, the uh, founder and owner of Wagner Group, which is a Russian extension of foreign policy. Um, proxies and little green men, none of these parties or entities can be a party to international humanitarian law. 
IHL, International Humanitarian Law, wrongly referred to as the Geneva Conventions, they form part of it, they're not all of it, um, can only be uh, agreed to and ratified, signed and ratified by nation states. Um, if, if you don't have a nation state, IHL doesn't really apply. Even to this point, the question being what will future war look like? Dr. Rob Johnson at the Future Warfare Conference in Amsterdam two weeks ago, his answer was, how will you know you are in a war? So how will you know you are actually in a war? This is the other problem. The nature of Russian offensive doctrine itself is this, uh, uh, another point I'd like to make here. I won't go into this in detail. Most of you, some of you may have heard of Glubokaya Operatsia, which is Russian for deep battle. It's a form of combined arms tactic that was used to success in the Eastern Front in the Second World War by the Red Army. There are several key features of battle. Artillery, which I've uh, outlined there in red, is a key feature of deep battle. Intense artillery barrages, saturation of grid squares and areas with high explosive. Russian army, everyone thinks it's a tank army. It is, it has tanks, less of them after going into Ukraine. However, it is more an artillery army with tanks. This very quickly is an organizational chart of a Russian motorized brigade. The little uh, symbols are tactical symbols. The point of this tree diagram, if you look at the red rings, the left-hand side red ring actually shows you the number of artillery units in a Russian motorized rifle brigade. That is three to four times the equivalent of artillery in a British brigade a US striker brigade or an Australian um, combat brigade. They have a lot of artillery. They also have a lot of air defense, which is the one in the middle, and they situate their electronic warfare down at brigade level for all of the, those of you in the know. Um, these assets are intense and focused. The Russian army is an artillery army and artillery is a big factor of the way they do war. And the, the way they do war is to go into urban areas and just simply destroy them. So the Western approach generally is to identify targets and go after targets of interest. The Russian approach, as has been shown in Grozny in 1994, as has been shown in Aleppo in 2013, as has been shown in Homs in 2013, is about saturating grid squares with high explosive and just destroying everything in that area. And we have evidence of this. That's how they do it. And if you've got a lot of artillery, that's how you do it. The picture at the beginning is actually a picture of the modern logistic battle space. This is a battle space packed with sensors. All movement is seen. You are 100% observed when moving to contact. So as the lady in her dress moves across that red carpet, she is 100% observed. There is nowhere to hide on the red carpet. So even if you employ camouflage trying to cross the red carpet, you will leave tracks. Um, I've seen drone footage of tanks under camouflage you can see them because you follow the tracks from the drone. Uh, um, there's no point putting a camouflage net or turning a radio off. You will see it. It tanks a 70 ton vehicle will leave tracks in grass. There's nothing to it. And lastly, this um, logistic uh, um, room service has knocked on my door. This logistic target is a soft skin, unarmored target with nowhere to hide. And if you put a red uh, sign on the back of that model, it doesn't really provide that much protection. So it's an analogy of the modern ta tactical logistic space. A couple of words on resilience. Um, the definition of resilience I've used for this talk is this one by Christopher and Peck, very well known in the supply chain management business. Uh, academia, returning to an original state, moving to a new state as a, uh, after being um, adaptive, being flexible, adaptability, transformation. These are all the senses of resilience. However, Resilience is an overused word. So in the, the recent um, integrated review, UK integrated review in 2021, I counted as, I was used 85 times in the UK integrated review and there were not a single definition was given of what resilience actually was. In NATO, there are a lot of uh, definitions going around in the system, especially in the latest NATO doctrine that's been released. But again, it's not really that well defined. That's actually one of the reasons why I'm doing this PhD. It's an overused, ill-defined word. It's a catch-all that I think in the end means nothing unless you define it. Very common re resilient response curve. Most of you in the audience will have seen it, ladies and gentlemen. It's about a big stress. You've got performance on the left, time on the right, big stress, performance drops. Resilience is a measure of how 
quickly, how readily you return to a functioning state or a new functioning state. So resilience is in that red ringed area of the curve. So when we're thinking about future resilience in NATO with military medical uh, logistics systems, we need to think about dispersal, not being in one place. We need to disaggregate. So if we have a central system of command and that central system of command is knocked out, the system knocks out. Systems need to be more self-functioning. That's what I define as disaggregation. We have to stop thinking about fixed territorial defence depots. So you recall about eight slides before, I, there was that squiggly map of the tactical uh, area of operations with the BSA, the brigade support area. It's a fixed, aggregated, non-dispersed group of logistic assets, fuel, medical, engineers, workshops that can be hit. The aim of all this is logistic resilience. This is a slide of the European Union Battle Group Medical Treatment Facility I took a month ago when I was part of the evaluation team. This is how they operate. This is how military medical logistic uh, units operate in NATO during Article 5 exercises. So the last Article 5 exercise that I attended, all the military medical units were aggregated like this in an Article 5 conflict. The red, the uh, correction, the yellow ring is the radius of one 122 millimeter Russian dumb artillery round. No laser guidance, no smart anything. It's just an artillery shell. If it lands in the middle of that, it takes the whole facility out. This is what I mean by dispersal and disaggregation. And what we as NATO military medical logisticians need to do is to think about operating in a way that's not so aggregated. That may be difficult to do with doctors and medical staff who are used to working in these sorts of situations. So word from our sponsor, uh, my PhD is on resilience. It's on how do we deliver military medical logistics in an Article 5 battlefield, which is a um, NATO Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all, major war fighting. How do we assess that resilience? And most importantly, how do we assess, define and assess that resilience so that an operational commander can actually assess how resilient their unit is that will save their lives and their units and their function. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. That's my email address with the usual kcl.ac.uk domain name. And I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing. All right. Thank you, uh, Ronald. Uh, I must say I'm impressed you got through all 30 slides uh, in under half an hour. So well done. I, I definitely had my doubts. Um, let's, <laughs> Me turn too. Right, let's turn it over right now to Patrick, who I believe had some, some uh, comments for discussion. And then after Patrick has uh, given his comments, then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So, so Patrick, please go ahead. Well, yeah, I just echo Mark's comments there, Ron. That was impressive. And uh, if you should start doing some lectures pretty quickly, so <laughs> you can rattle through your slides that well. Um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Thanks for that. Um, there's loads. I thought there was lots of interesting um, tidbits in there of um, in terms of like the T-80 and, and the cost of that and the drones as well, little tactical uh, pieces of information. But I suppose what I, I, I would do is, is wanting to, you know, where you sort of finished up about how do you see um, the Western response to this changing battlefield? You know, um, there's, a, there's a few questions to unpack from that, I suppose. So one would be the start one is looking at the medical facilities and the way that it's set up in NATO, yeah, and then looking at Russia's conventional capabilities, do you think that we need to be as worried about those capabilities as we were before Ukraine or not? And they're also their, in, their will and intent to target, for example, medical facilities against the West. It's a different it's a different bag of um, kettle of fish, you know, to, attack, to do it in Georgia in 2008 versus a NATO hospital? Gosh, um, big um. I think I'll answer that question at two levels, uh, Patty. Um, we have learned, no, wrong. We have seen what they do and we haven't learned the lessons. Suddenly it comes close to us and it becomes a concern or it might be a concern. I assess that in the NATO military medical area, there is very little concern because the senior people in NATO military medicine are a certain generation that didn't have to worry about that. They grew up in an, a place where the nation state did war and we followed the laws of armed conflict. I think that's the first, I think it's a, a slightly a generational problem. 
I think it's also a denial problem, denial not being a river in Africa, but a, a question of, well, look, really that can't happen to us. As to whether, well, um, there were Georgians, they were Syrians, they couldn't possibly do it to NATO. I think that's an assumption. I think that's an assumption with respect as valid as saying, you know what, the Japanese will never bomb us at nighttime in 1942 because they can't fly at night. They don't have good vision. It's not a good assumption. I think we have to assume that we'll be targeted. I, I, I think it is better to assume that we'll be targeted and redo our doctrine and our tactics, techniques and procedures more than assuming that we won't be targeted and the enemy will continue to respect the laws of armed conflict, especially since that enemy may not be a recognised nation state, as I pointed out in the middle of my talk. They may be a private military company. They may be a, a an Islamic state type insurgency. They may be a, a rogue state. So I, I to, to answer your question, um, yes, I believe that this needs to be looked at rather than not looked at. And I don't believe that we won't be targeted. Sorry to put a, a double negative in there. As barbarism advances and as we find mass graves in Ukraine, why can't that happen to NATO? If you want to win a war and you knock out the, the military medical logistics, which is 2%, you will knock out the capability to, to continue operations. It's the quickest way to do it. Yeah, in 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 theory, anyway, I would say you're totally right about you have to prepare for the worst uh, and hope for the best. And I agree. Nevertheless, fighting NATO, if you take out, for example, a NATO hospital in a conflict with NATO, guess what's going to happen to your centralized hospitals, etc. Now, the Russians will go, well, we don't care. We don't care about casualties in the way that NATO do. So, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. I was just sort of being, I, I, I was just sort of pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, oh, please, yeah. in, in, um, in terms of future, so, like, what does this look like to you if, 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 you know, we've had centralized hospitals, um, as, as they do. You have generally centralized echelon logistics. It was different in Afghanistan because of the no nature. And in some way, NATO has got a more or has practiced a more, um, what's the word, protected uh, tactical focus logistics in terms of its resupplies um, in Afghanistan than the Russians have done so far with their soft skin vehicles and, and absolutely no protection in Ukraine. But what do you see then as kind of what does it look like? The logistics of the future done by the West then what where do you see like is it going to be drone swarms deliveries over the last tactical mile um robotics obviously what's your kind of sense of how does this work obviously you're going to have to be dispersed um another element to this is not only dispersed but limited comms um yes. probably you know um yes, yes. So what, I, how, what do i see mm. interesting question it's a really good question Unusually for an Australian Army Reserve officer, a lot of my experience has actually been in the Baltics mm. and in a, the closed space of Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia. What we are seeing is the application of, I don't want to go down a tangent, a resistance operating concept. So it's, it's total defence based on making a nation's facilities resilient, and that includes health facilities. So I, what we will be seeing, I believe, much like the special forces community, is we'll be breaking our centralised treatment areas, our logistic nodes, into much smaller nodes. Yeah. If you then look across the Pacific as what the US Marines are thinking of practising with contested logistics in the, in the South China Sea, in the China yeah, area of operations, if I put it that way, they are looking at many disaggregated nodes that are all self-functioning and able to, to, to function when the overriding network of command and control is disrupted. Yeah. Because we know that the Chinese protect, um, practice what they call the three warfares, and one of them is systems destruction. That is actually written in PLA military doctrine. Back yeah. to this talk. So I believe that we're going to have dispersed nodes. We're going to have decentralized command, known as mission command. And we're going to have... Um, as you pointed out, the technological advantages of unmanned aerial systems, but more to the point, unmanned ground systems. So a single unmanned ground system is done by MILSYS in Estonia now, can carry one stretcher casualty or two on a totally unmanned vehicle uh, that has artificial intelligence that can actually work out its best, um, its best route. Uh, its maintenance schedule is all defined by the algorithms and its AI. So I think we're looking at 
a constrained battle space. We're not going to have the kind of helicopter evacuation you saw and I saw in Afghanistan because helicopters are not flying. There is YouTube video after YouTube video of Russian attack helicopters getting zapped by um, man, pads, um, um, man portable air defence uh, missiles. We can't do that now. We're going to have to move them out somehow, or maybe we don't move them out at all. As one uh, commentator uh, said to me, US Army medical um, officer, this is not blood far forward. This is blood far rear. So instead of pushing blood forward and saving lives, maybe we just keep it in the rear area for the ones who managed to survive that we can get them back. That's a totally different paradigm. That's so exactly your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally different. So, so I think in response to your question, and summarize, it's about dispersal, disaggregation, nodes, limited battlefield movement, use of unmanned, ve unmanned vehicles, changing thinking and changing thinking with casualties and what we're prepared to tolerate. Thanks, Ron. And I was going to, this is so if it's nodes, does this mean kind of stocks? And I'm not just talking medical here, but stocks actually push forward into packs almost. And then, and then, and then be. more resilience. And I, guys, this is what you have. If it kicks off, that's it. Like you're, you're not going to be in comms. You're not likely to get anything back. So you're, you know, yeah. when you run out of that, you're going to be overrun essentially. Is that what we're looking at? It has yeah, to so, be. Sorry, just one sec, Ron, before you answer that, um, I just, for the audience, could you, if you guys have questions you, you'd like us to field after Patrick and Ron are, are done the discussion, could you put them either in the chat or in the Q&A button below? Um, you can also use the hand function. I can enable you to talk. But sorry, Ron, your answer to, to Patrick's question. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, um, we, we need to look at the special forces community for that, Patrick. Uh, the special forces community are used to operating away from uh, established support in a disaggregated, dispersed manner, yeah. in nodes with self-contained command and control. I think SOF is the way we look at it. I'm not a SOF expert. I've actually never worked in a SOF posting, but looking at their resistant operating concept that developed, for, especially to be applied in the Baltics, I, th I think, I feel that's probably the way we're going. Just a quick word on intergenerational stuff. What we're teaching in staff colleges needs to change as well. So NATO staff colleges are still teaching this nonsense about front lines, rear areas, forward edge of battle area, as though they are solid trench lines and Napoleonic lines. The reason the Russians got zapped so badly was there was no front line. They were pushing down roads and Russian hunter killer teams were getting behind the lines and zapping their logistic convoys. There is no longer a front line. And this is reminiscent of Afghanistan. Very yeah. little is, but this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And, and I suppose so. The next one is that the the um, kill to wounded ratio that we've all become accustomed to growing since Vietnam and even before is going to atrophy basically. And yes. and you'd see that if there's a major war and it will come back down to some something much more. Because essentially, for other listeners, it had got up to I think in in Afghanistan, the US was able to have basically their medical evacuation was so good that it got to one one death for every ten seriously wounded. You know, something um, like that. Yeah. Something like that around there. Because and then. Um, uh, when it's usually like in the Second World War, one to three for a functioning, and the Russians are operating at around one to three uh, at the moment. So, um, so I suppose we'll expect that to go down. I, I think, Ron, uh, you know, we, you and I, have, could chat for ages uh, on this, but um, I should open it up. Or Mark, maybe, what would like to open it up for some um, questions and comments from the audience? Yeah, um, there's nothing in the chat or the Q and A yet. But does anyone have a question? Feel free to hit the raise hand function. I can allow you to talk. <laughs> uh, use your vocal cord instead of typing. Nothing yet. I've stunned them to silence. Yeah. Um. I sp I'll jump in then. What do you you know? You mentioned in the um in your presentation about costs being subordinate. You know to the mission. Which, but I, like you know, my own research on this is is sort of like efficiency has kind of become almost certainly in peacetime um and debatably even in wartime uh uh the primary judgment on cer well, certainly british military logistics you know how much is it going to cost and how efficiently you can do this to make savings rather than effectiveness you know and military effect which is ultimately what we're judged at in warfare what's your thoughts on that my thoughts on that <laughs> very easy to, to to reply to this one patrick i think defense procurement is it's not schizophrenic. That's the wrong use of the psychiatric term. It's multi-personality disorder. So at one hand, uh, defence procurement is all at best value for money, um, lowest price, most technically compliant tender LPTC. Uh, having spent some time in that contracting procurement area, both as a civilian bidding and as a military person 
designing the bids, it is multi multi personnel disorder. What do I mean by that? On one hand, uh, value for money and cost is paramount. However, there will be an urgent situation where that's all put aside. And the example of MRAPs in Afghanistan is a good one. So an MRAP, for those of you who don't know, is a mine resistant uh, armored um, vehicle, uh, mine resistant vehicle. Um, the Pentagon resisted deploying these to Afghanistan or was it Iraq until Robert Gates, the defense secretary actually personally intervened and made them buy it and sent it to the troops. The US procurement people were not gonna bother because it wasn't that area. There was that disconnect between the operational side and the procurement side. So when I say it's multi-personality, what the operational guys often want is not what the procurement guys have programmed five years into the future, and suddenly this urgent demand has come up. All the nations, as you know, Patrick, they try and get around this with this urgent procurement program, but the fact remains, defence procurement is a stovepipe organisation. One side doesn't often talk to the other, and we don't really know what's going on. So both things are true. Cost is paramount. Cost containment is paramount, but the mission is also paramount. Mm. And I think it's a dynamic balance between the bean counters and the war fighters to oversimplify it, you know, very and large. a sense of mission, the national sense of mission, priority really too. You yes, um, yes. Yeah, you can always borrow if you have to, essentially. You, um, you can always borrow. As long as there's a backer who supports your cause, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's interesting. I remember on the procurement from my own experience, they uh, they brought out a new blue uh, force tracker, personal one for a platoon level. And they'd been developing this, I think it was with Nokia or something, for years, right? And you're thinking it had gone through all the infantry trials. We got handed it. This is a new piece of kit. It should be handy. It was squatty proof. And uh, they gave it to us. And we, and we used it for a day or two in Afghanistan. But they hadn't thought this through, right? It took eight batteries, eight, eight AAA batteries per unit. Imagine to run it. Yeah. Didn't think about so it. So you needed that was for eight hours. So you needed to be carrying each person carrying 24 AAA batteries out in the 40 degree Afghan heat. We were just like, this is this is bananas. How are we going to carry all this? You know? Yes. So and it was sapped off from that perspective. Like we were just like, this, this is logistically too difficult for us to use. Yeah. Not really that it, 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 it sort of half worked, but so sometimes these things that come through exactly until they meet contact with with the reality which changes, you don't actually know. Um no, you don't. Is. Yeah, but I did see um, the chief of the defense over here say that actually maybe going ur urgent operational requirements off the shelf may be the future for British procurement. Um, and he just yes. said that in the last couple of days. So we shall see. Um, we shall see. No, right. and, and what about your, um, Ron, with your PhD? Like, are you how are you conceptualizing change? Like, what, what's your kind of theoretical route on, on things? My theoretical route on things is that I originally started off to design a resi resilience assessment methodology to be applied at the tactical level. That's too big a project. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually limiting it to the first part of that process, which is um, identifying inputs to resilience for a tactical commander. So it's, it's wow. quite a modest PhD achievable objective. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, the trouble with resilience assessment methodologies is that it require extensive databases and you have to be able to examine outputs. You have to be able to examine the result to see yeah. if your system is resilient or not. That is much too big for a PhD thesis. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. postdoc stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And beyond. And it's, beyond. It's, a systems, it's a systems stuff, basically. You need a whole team, yes. yeah. I yeah, think yeah. Um, just very quickly, I've got a two-phase uh, research methodology. The first one look, talks to experienced military medical logistic practitioners and asks them what are the inputs. The second one is... Um, I don't want to jinx this, and we're amongst friends here, but 99% certain they're going to run my PhD research as part of the Estonian National Defence exercise next year. And they're integrating my logistics war game into the exercise to assess how we can engender resilience within the training audience. So that's going to be big. It's a very real-world application of a PhD theory, I think, humbly. That's, so, that's pretty impressive. And, the, yeah. and, and, and you've kind of come up with this war game yourself rather than... Yes. Rather than, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've I've come up with a war game myself, and I think it's had I think three or four iterations. Okay. UAE jumped onto it, the Estonians jumped onto it, Belgium, Lithuanian, and NATO at Bigris Warrior. So it's had a few iterations, and it's now in like Mark Five. So amazing! Um, yeah, that's 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 where I'm going. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, um, no, that's really really interesting. You know, really interesting. You can get me an invite for the uh, exercise. Do you want one? I would, yeah. Come out, definitely. I'd be really interested to see. Is anyone? Is there, are there any questions there? Are we? 
Yes, we do have some questions. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, first question for you, Ron, is from Patrick Hinton. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read them in the Q&A yourself, but I'll just read them out for everyone. No, I can't. Uh, do military medical stockpiles suffer from the lack of resilience and industrial capacity that has been seen on the Western munitions side? Are solutions being pursued in light of Ukraine? Oh, Patrick, what a great question. This is why I'm doing a PhD in military medical logistic resilience, because class eights, which is the US Australian classification of medical supplies, are the least resilient logistic items in your logistic uh, family of items, you know, of your 36,000 items with NATO stock numbers, medical supplies and blood, they're the least resilient. So that's why I've picked them because they are the least resilient. Do they have shelf life issues? Absolutely. So ammunition goes off, so to speak. We don't have enough of it. You know, the, 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 this is the denial about uh, 2013 in Libya. The West ran out of munitions. We had to use, we had to get it from the Americans, right? The shortage of ammunition is is uh, ignored, denied, same with medical supplies, but medical supplies are even less resilient. So a unit of blood after one hour at room temperature loses its ability to coagulate. It loses its ability to do any of the things that we wanted to do to save lives in a resuscitation. So absolutely, they're, they're, they're not resilient. They're the least resilient and absolutely have shelf life uh, issues. They are thermolabile, very sensitive. Uh, we've got another question for you as well, Ron. Uh, this one's from Danny Looney. I'm not sure if that's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Danny. <laughs> so Good day, Danny. The, uh, the question from Danny is, you discussed visual detection with UAS. How does the increased signal detection compete with the visual? Um, and he says, dispersed forces may need to talk more often. Yes. Danny, that's a great question. Um, I talked about UAS, but understand this is a very uh, limited lecture. I can't go into every single part. I made the point that the battlefield is is under constant vision, the model walking across the carpet. So there is um, ground movement target indication radar that can actually detect movement out to 200 kilometres. It's very gross. However, if we see a group of metal objects moving at two miles an hour through a forest, it's probably an infantry unit. OK, you can then queue in more um, refined methods of detection. So there's not just the good old turn the radar off stuff, which can lead to accidents. There's a whole electromagnetic signature. And you know, as I know, a brigade headquarters, a company headquarters lights up like a Christmas tree. So when you actually see it across the electromagnetic spectrum, it lights up in infrared. It can be seen from space. Yeah, totally. So your question about, well, are there a whole lot of other modalities? Yes, it's more than just visual. Visual is important. Um, but um, yes, there's all, 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 all sorts of other things to consider. In the concept of military medical logistic resilience, it may be virtually impossible to reduce the electromagnetic signature of a military medical logistic unit, or will it? We haven't done that yet. We haven't tested that we can disperse and disaggregate them. We actually haven't seen what sort of signature they give out. At least in the unclassified research I've seen, there's not a single study that looks at that with military medical units, which generate a lot of heat and signature like a company or battalion headquarters. I think that's for future research. It's well outside the scope of a single PhD. All right, does anyone have any other questions from the audience uh, for uh, Dr. T? Patrick, do you have any more questions while we're maybe- No, we... I just think on that point, it's really interesting. Uh, he, he... It actually, because I, I I think and Danny's there asking like, right, yes, dispersed units would need to communicate more. I I wonder if they'd be able to, if 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 um, depending on the conventional capabilities of the adversary and whether they're, you know, certainly this was something that was being bandied about before uh, Ukraine that Russia had the edge on the EW, um, on the EW front. But uh, I, and I, don't, I, I don't know actually how it, it's still capable, but I don't know if it's to that extent, uh, you know, capable in terms of you, it would force a dispersal and a, and a, a lack of use of, of comms. Um, but it does it does come down to that. There's another element to this, too, which is all tied in, which is actually orders and the pace of orders. And this ties in with what Ron was talking about in terms of um, training staff officers, but not only staff officers, all officers, because the. The, the orders process, certainly, if, if it's anything like I went through, is so cumbersome and slow. Um, 
Yes. That the the tempo and the spurs. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is it. You know, and, and, and I, I remember looking at Libya and, and like, you're like, God, a militia in Libya could probably organize a company attack faster than a, a, um, a, a company, you know, over WhatsApp. Now, look, yeah, it's it's in the clear, yes. and all, but it's hiding in the noise. The problem is when a militia attack, they're not as well trained as the company. If they, they go through, there's a balance to be struck. But um, there's certainly more to be done there as well, I think, about pace and tempo. Yes, I, th I think the militia would use signal. The Estonian yeah, yeah, well, probably, yeah. use signal. The Kites elite use signal. Um, yeah. Interestingly, yeah. Um, yes. Thank you for reminding me about Danny's question. Danny, um, your question about units talking to one another is very important. Um, I want to reference Jack Watling at Rusi on this one. Jack makes the point that there is a tolerance in the West about not communicating. What does that mean? If you switch radios off and you move people around at night, you are going to get accidents. So even with the special forces training, there's only a certain amount of training they can do before they reach a point where, where people start getting killed during training. So the, way, the, the level at which we can practice non-communication and dispersal may actually be limited by occupational health and safety considerations in the West. And we may not actually be able to turn off our radios as, as much or turn off our communications as much to practices as we could. Why? Because in the real world of training, people will start having accidents and people will die. And it'll turn up on the front page of pick a newspaper, International Herald Tribune, The Sun, whatever. Um, so the point about communication is it's a balance between practicing dispersal, practicing limited communications, but balancing that limited communications against the risk of accidents and training accidents. Not my point, Jack Watling's point, but a very good point to mention here, I think. Um, this is not a wicked problem, but it's something that needs to be looked at more, I think, especially with military medical logistics, not just combat units, but logisticians. Um, Paddy, you had a point. To no, I was just going to say, I'd say if in the case of a general war, though, that risk appetite for, for occupational uh, accidents would go out the window, essentially, you know, yes. generally. When you have that. Remember in the Second World War, they had people jumping out the back of trucks to see if they landed from a parachute, you know. Yeah, I, I, I took Danny's question as, um, you know, what do we do in a steady yeah, state? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, agree. Yeah. I think it, with urgency, with the Ukraine, their, their nation is, 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 has an existential threat. You yeah, know, at its doorstep on its territory. So all those things tend to go out the window a bit. Mm. You yeah, agree? And we could talk. I think the real big one here is going to be Taiwan. Actually, you know, as we move on, in in some ways, Ukraine. And this is not to diminish the struggle there, but I think we'll probably see it, the contours of how it may end over the next year or so. And um, Taiwan logistically would be absolutely fascinating. We could talk at that ad hominem, you know. We could. Yeah. That's 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 a big named area of interest for myself as a as an Australian military person. Um, of course, yeah. Looking at that 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 area, the South China Sea, um, Chinese distance strike. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Chinese exactly. three warfare technique. Um, yeah. yeah, doctrine. Um, yeah, that's another. I think that's another session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I don't know, Mark. Is there any other questions? Or there, there aren't. Uh, I'll throw it out there. One. Any last questions for um, Dr. T from the audience? If not, I think uh, Ron, we've uh, worked you fairly hard already. Um, yeah. Seems like you you've had a, a a very good discussion with with, with Patrick and 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 some of the questions were really. quite uh, informative as well. Um, so I'd like everyone, you know, just to thank uh, thank Ron for his talk. Uh, so. Uh, join me in a, a round of applause, if you will. Thank you. There we Thank go. You. Thanks, Mark, for organizing. Uh, and yes, yes. Thank you as well, Patrick, for, for being such an engaged uh, discussant. Uh, before we um, uh, end the session, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone that uh, the next event um, taking place in the New Voices Seminar is going to be on the 9th of November. Um, it's we're going to have um, Dr. Francisco Mazzola, who's a visiting lecturer in international relations and security studies um, at uh, City University of London, speaking about community policing in Lebanon between counterinsurgency and securitization. Uh, and again, that'll be 9th of November, same time uh, as this session. Uh, so, yeah, thanks again, Ron, for a, a fascinating yeah. talk and I and hope everyone has a good rest of the afternoon.